Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Welcome to Policy and Rights, the show about human rights and government policy. Okay, so um, welcome back to the show, and today we had some really encouraging news uh, for small and medium-sized businesses with uh, a 75% wage subsidy um, for those businesses to, to apply. Um, they, they, they qualify for, uh, for the subsidy um, to really help um, keep small businesses afloat. Um, from Justin Trudeau, uh, along with uh, with some other really important uh, things that he's going to have to say in this next clip, and uh, let's play that right now. Bonjour tout le monde. Hello everyone. Bon vendredi. Let me just begin by saying I'm pleased with the supporting actions taken by the Bank of Canada this morning. Monetary policy is very important. But as the governor of the bank has repeatedly said, the most important thing we can do to, to help people and the economy in this crisis is for the government to take strong fiscal action. So today, I want to speak directly to small businesses and entrepreneurs. I know that for many of you, the past few weeks have been heartbreaking. You've had to slow down your operations. In some cases, you even had to close up shop for the foreseeable future. And because money isn't coming in, you can't afford to keep your employees on the payroll. These are really tough decisions. Tough because you don't want to let the people go who help you run your company in their time of need. Tough because some of you have built your business over the course of many years, if not decades. And now it seems like this climate of uncertainty could threaten everything you've worked for. I know many Canadians across the country are saddened to see their favorite neighborhood spots closed. These are the places that make our communities feel like home. Our government knows you're really feeling the impacts of this pandemic, especially with the end of the month coming up. So here's what we're going to do to take some of that pressure off. Last week, we had announced that we would cover 10% of wages but it's becoming clear that we need to do more, much more. So we're bringing that percentage up to 75% for qualifying businesses. This means that people will continue to be paid even though their employer has had to slow down or stop its operations because of COVID-19. We're helping companies keep people on the payroll so that workers are supported and the economy is positioned to recover from this. That is our priority. We will have more to say on this very soon, but I can tell you that this subsidy for small and medium-sized businesses will be backdated to Sunday, March 15th. For people who've lost their job or are self-employed, the Canada Emergency Response Benefit will still be there to help you. We also know that for small storefront businesses, they're struggling with cash flow right now. It's hard to raise money and make money in this climate. So to help you bridge to better times, we're launching the Canada Emergency Business Account. With this new measure, banks will soon offer $40,000 loans, which will be guaranteed by the government to qualifying businesses. The loan will be interest-free for the first year, and if you meet certain conditions, $10,000 of it will be forgivable. Our government will also provide an additional $12.5 billion through Export Development Canada and the Business Development Bank to help small and medium-sized businesses with their operational cash flow requirements. This means that businesses will be able to apply for a guaranteed loan when they go to their financial institutions to get help as they weather the impacts of COVID-19. Lastly, we're announcing that we will defer 
GST and HST payments, as well as duties and taxes owed on imports, until June. This is the equivalent of giving $30 billion in interest-free loans to businesses. So if you're struggling to get by right now and you have a payment due at the end of the quarter, we're going to give you more time. It will also allow you to keep the money that you would have been sent to the government and use it instead for your immediate needs. With these new measures, our hope is that employers who are being pushed towards laying off people because of COVID-19 will think again. And for those of you who've already had to lay off workers, we hope you will consider rehiring them given this payroll support. Over the coming days, we will announce additional measures to help the most vulnerable. Youth, marginalized people, people who live in poverty. We're going to have more news to share with you very soon. Ce matin, je veux parler aux entrepreneurs et aux propriétaires de petites et moyennes entreprises. Je sais qu'au cours des dernières semaines, vous avez été appelés à prendre des décisions très difficiles. Certains ne peuvent pas se permettre de payer leurs employés. D'autres ont dû mettre fin à leurs activités. La pandémie a déstabilisé l'économie mondiale et le climat d'incertitude dans lequel on se trouve en ce moment vous inquiète grandement. La semaine dernière, notre gouvernement a annoncé une série de mesures pour vous aider, mais vous nous avez dit que vous en avez besoin de plus. On vous a entendu. Donc aujourd'hui, on annonce des mesures additionnelles pour vous aider. La semaine passée, on avait annoncé qu'on allait subventionner 10% des salaires, mais c'est clair qu'on doit aller plus loin. Donc le pourcentage passera à 75% pour les petites et moyennes entreprises admissibles. Ça veut dire que les employés continueront d'être payés même si l'entreprise pour laquelle ils travaillent a dû ralentir ou arrêter ses activités à cause de la COVID-19. On aide les employeurs à garder leurs employés pour soutenir les travailleurs et favoriser la reprise de l'économie. C'est notre priorité. Nous aurons plus de détails là-dessus bientôt, très bientôt, mais pour l'instant, je peux vous dire que cette subvention sera rétroactive au 15 mars. Et pour ceux qui ont perdu leur emploi ou qui sont travailleurs autonomes, la nouvelle prestation canadienne d'urgence est toujours là pour vous aider. On sait aussi que les petites entreprises ont des problèmes de liquidité en ce moment. C'est difficile d'obtenir du financement et de faire de l'argent dans le climat actuel. Pour vous aider à traverser ces moments difficiles, on lance le compte d'urgence pour les entreprises. Grâce à cette mesure, les banques offriront bientôt des prêts de 40 000 qui seront garantis par le gouvernement aux entreprises admissibles. Le prêt sera sans intérêt pour la première année et si vous répondez à certaines conditions, 10 000 de cela sera, euh, sera euh, non remboursable. Notre gouvernement va également fournir 12,5 milliards de dollars additionnels à, Ex à Export Développement Canada et à la Banque de Développement du Canada pour aider les petites et moyennes entreprises avec leurs besoins de liquidité. Donc, les entreprises pourront appliquer pour un prêt garanti lorsqu'elles se tournent vers une institution financière pour obtenir de l'aide pour atténuer les impacts de la COVID-19. Finalement, notre gouvernement annonce que les gens auront jusqu'au mois de juin pour effectuer leur paiement de TPS et TVH pour rembourser les, et pour rembourser les taxes et les droits exigibles sur les, les importations. C'est l'équivalent d'accorder 30 milliards de dollars de prêts sans intérêt aux entreprises. Donc, si vous avez du mal à joindre les deux bouts à cause de la pandémie et que vous devez de l'argent à la fin du trimestre, on va vous donner plus de temps pour effectuer vos paiements. Ça va aussi vous permettre de garder plus d'argent pour payer vos dépenses quotidiennes. On espère que ces nouvelles mesures encourageront les employeurs qui pensent être forcés à congédier leurs employés à y repenser. Et si vous avez déjà fait des mises à pied, on espère que vous allez envisager de réengager vos employés grâce à cette subvention salariale. Au cours des prochains jours, on va annoncer d'autres mesures de soutien pour aider les gens les plus vulnérables. Les jeunes, les personnes marginalisées, les gens qui vivent dans la pauvreté, on aura des nouvelles pour vous très bientôt. 
I know the past weeks have been really tough. You're worried about what COVID-19 means for your business and for your future. These are uncertain times, but my message to you today is we're going to be here for you. Small and medium-sized businesses are the backbone of our economy. You are collectively the largest employer in the country. You support millions of families. You serve our communities, and you make our towns and cities better places to live. Canadians are counting on you, and I am counting on you to come back strong from this no matter what comes next. You're going to get the support you need to help rebuild a more resilient and prosperous economy. So to businesses across the country, please keep your workers on the payroll or think of hiring them back. In the meantime, let's keep listening to our public health officials. Let's wash our hands, stay home as much as possible, and keep a safe distance from each other when we go for a walk or when we have to go to the grocery store. Together, I know we're going to get through this. Merci beaucoup tout le monde. And some encouraging news uh, for those of us who are living here in uh, British Columbia, where the measures that, that we've been taking, um, as tough as they are, um, with social distancing and um, other measures to um, not infect other people around us, um, have seemingly seemingly are working and uh, Bonnie Henry was uh, and Adrian Dix introduced a model of how we can work our way through the uh, pandemic and not overwhelm health care by, by continuing with the measures that we already have put, put in place and maybe adding some other new ones to ensure that we um, keep our social distance uh, at a maximum. Okay, so here we go with that. This slide deck will be made available on the BCCDC website uh, around the end of this presentation. The slide deck, it took about an hour to go through, so the slide deck and the slides that we're presenting today are slightly shorter than that uh, for, uh, for brevity. But uh, Dr. Henry and I are uh, prepared to take questions on, of course, all of the information that's presented this morning, and all of it will be available to members of the public. And with that, I wanted to introduce Dr. Bonnie Henry. Thank you, and good morning. Um, so this is uh, something that we've been looking forward to being able to share with you all um, around uh, some of the work that has been done around modeling and how it has informed not only how we're monitoring the progress of this pandemic in BC, but also how it's informed our planning, and that's really important. And I will start with saying um, that this is modeling. So it is not a prediction. It's not a prediction of where we might be or how we might go. It's a set of parameters that allow us to make some rational decisions about planning. And as well, there's different types of modeling we're going to talk about this morning. And um, we'll get started with, uh, with working on this. So the first type of modeling that I'm going to talk about is around how do we know where we are compared to what other populations have happened around the globe. And uh, the BC CDC has done most of this work and it is uh, modeled around uh, what's happening in Canada, what's happening around the globe. And I will say that there's a slight um, chance of optimism perhaps that our rate of growth is being impacted by the measures that we've put in in the last couple of weeks. But I'll show you, um, I'll walk you through that. So this uh, shows what we call a case rate comparison. So rates mean numbers per population. And what we're using here is uh, the, the numbers of cases per million. And we're comparing um, different jurisdictions. So this one, um, we pulled everybody back to when they first be, um, hit the rate of two per, per million population. And so for BC, that pulls us back to day one. We're a little bit ahead of the rest of Canada, and that's why the line for BC um, is a little bit farther ahead um, than the, the line for Canada. 
But as you can see, the lines for Spain and for Italy, Norway, Germany, some of the other countries have started to dramatically increase, usually around day seven, day eight. And what we're seeing here in BC and in Canada is that line has stayed relatively low. It is, of course, starting to increase and has been increasing about day 14 until now. And we'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. What also you can see on this model is uh, South Korea, which also started increasing um, in the first couple of weeks and then flattened out. And that's what we need to, when we talk about flattening the curve or flattening, um, bending the curve, that's what we want to look at for BC. We don't want it to get that high, but that's what we've been talking about in terms of flattening the curve. We can also see that the United States is also behind in the time frame of since they reached two cases per million, at least reported two cases per million, and it is now starting to, to move dramatically increased as well. So that, um, this modeling is based on uh, comparing what's happening in BC to hap what's happening in other countries and pulling it back so that we're all on the starting at the same time frame. And this uh, comparison looks at the cum cumulative numbers of cases. So these are the, what we've been presenting every day. The number of people in BC who test positive for COVID-19. And it compares that to the number of cases that test positive in other parts of the world. And in this case, we've been looking at how the outbreak um, uh, flowed through time in Hubei and in Italy. And again, um, this starts at when you've had 100 cases in that jurisdiction. The reason that we pull things down to 100 cases or two cases per million is because below that, when you have very small numbers, things can change very dramatically with just one or two numbers difference. It's what we call unstable. So we try and make it as, as reliable and as stable as possible so that we have an accurate comparison. And of course, that's one of the reasons why we haven't presented this data before now, these data before now, because we haven't had enough cases to be confident that this is actually meaningful. But right now, we are confident that this gives us a good sense of where we are in our trajectory right now in BC compared to these other jurisdictions. And as you can see, the, the dark red line is British Columbia, and we are trending up clearly, and we know that because we've had new cases every day, and those have increased in the last couple of weeks. Um, but we are maybe starting to, um, to bend a little bit here. I, I will say that this is based on cumulative cases. And as you know, our testing strategy has changed over the, uh, the last few weeks, where initially we were very focused on testing people who had come in from other countries so that we could detect when pe people were coming into the uh, BC and into Canada with this disease. We've now changed our strategy because we know that people who uh, are coming into BC have potentially been exposed to this and we know where their exposures are. So our testing strategy is focused on our community, on people who are getting um, infections in BC and also on our healthcare system. Very specific we are looking at making sure we uh, detect any cases in our hospitals, in healthcare workers, and in long-term care, because we know those are where we can get outbreaks, where we can get transmission that can um, take out healthcare workers and our health facilities. So we've been very focused on making sure we understand what's happening in those facilities. Having said that, we have not stopped the volume of testing that we're doing. What we're doing is focusing it in on the highest risk populations, and we've been doing 3,000 tests a day, um, more than um, many other jurisdictions, and, and actually comparable to what we saw in, with a testing strategy in other countries like Singapore, like um, uh, South Korea. And I think that's important. So the second type of modeling that we're using, there's uh, uh, different, <laughs> lots of different types of models, but um, this is one that's looking at how, um, how is the change in BC happening over time. And it is looking at uh, the percent change or the daily increase, the trajectory that of the cases that we're seeing here in BC. 
We also are doing some what we call dynamic modeling that looks at impacts of measures that have been taken. But that modeling is still at a very early stage because we haven't, thankfully, had a lot of cases yet in BC. And we are still within the time frame of uh, implementation of some of the, the broad social measures that we've all been impacted by in the last few weeks. So I'm going to walk through this slide um, in a little bit of detail so you understand what I've been looking at quite intently every day for the last number of weeks. So the red line is what we are actually seeing in British Columbia right now. And as you can see, we started really, uh, this, is, this is again rates. So num numbers of cases per million in British Columbia. And we, on the 4th of March is when we started to reach that threshold of two cases per million in our province. As you can see, things um, grumbled along for a little while. And then around 14th, 15th of March is another really important day. So the, the 13th was when we announced travel restrictions, when we announced um, some of the major uh, um, orders that and restrictions on movement. And we started implementing the important physical distancing measures in our community. And that was because we realized that we were seeing transmission in the community that was not related to travel or to known cases. So uh, very early on, we put in some of these now, you know, very restrictive measures that we've been seeing um, put in place in countries around the world. So we, uh, I, I look at the 14th, 15th of March, when schools were closed for March break, when we had these travel restrictions and implementations of, of our social distancing starting to get that message out. It is, of course, as we know, taken a couple of days for people to understand what does that mean for me? What does that mean for me as a business? How do we manage um, in, in groups like restaurants and bars? And as you know, we've restricted how they can work. We've restricted uh, certain businesses where you can't maintain those physical distances. Um, all of those implementations started the week of March 15th, 16th. So for me, when I'm looking at this curve, I know that there are people who were exposed to this virus prior to that date who are going to become sick in the 14 days after their exposure. So it is not surprising, and we've been seeing that in the last 10 days, we've started to see um, people becoming ill. What these important measures that we have put in place that all of us need to, to pay attention to, these distancing measures, we're going to start to see the impact of those in the coming week to two weeks. So the second incubation period from when they started. Um, so when we look at this graph, that's what we're starting to see in the red line. And, and I, I, I'm trying not to overcall it, but I do believe we've seen a flattening, a falling off of that curve. And we can look at the gray line, and as you can see, the gray line continues to go up. And so that is what the modelers think would have happened had we not put in some of the, the measures that we put in. So there are a couple of things. Our trajectory, so the, the progress that we're seeing, changed from an increase of about 24% per day down to around 12% per day. So that's a slowing down of the numbers of new cases, which is good. And it's because of a whole variety of things. One is our changing testing strategy, but also um, you know, driven by our physical distancing and the important thing that everybody is paying attention to that physical distancing, as well as the restrictions in travel. So that other group of people that were continuing to come into BC, uh, having been exposed to this virus in other countries, that has also stopped. And that's made a difference in our trajectory as well. So that is the part that I'm going to be watching very, very carefully over the next coming weeks to months. And that's the part that we talk about when we're saying, you know, bending or flattening that curve. Um, finally, I will say, you know, that if we look at this, and, and these are, again, approximations or models, right now, um, we're, um, with our reported cases, we're about 130 cases per million population. If we had continued on the same trajectory that we had been on on the 14th of March, we would have expected to have about 215 cases per million. 
So we think that we've reduced that quite dramatically. What we need, though, is for everybody to continue to pay attention to these measures so that we can continue to prevent the transmission in our communities, continue to separate, to, to stop those chains of transmission in all of the settings in our communities for the coming weeks. And that's what we'll be watching um, going forward. And finally, just so you know, the, the blue line on there, uh, again, Canada as a whole was farther behind in, in reaching that two cases per million rate. And the blue line reflects what's happening um, across the country. And really, the, the steep inflection in the last few days has been because of the, the inclusion of a number of, of uh, uh, probable cases in Quebec that added to the total quite significantly. So this is the modeling that we've been using, both to follow the trajectory that we have, and now I'm going to turn it over to Minister Dix to look at some of the other models that we have put in place that have helped inform our planning. And again, I just want to say these are not predictions. They're actually using of data to help us um, plot a, a course that we can all get around and understand and understand how we might be able to respond to our pandemic as it evolves in BC. Oh, okay. I, sorry, I, I, there is one more slide that talks about our expected rates of growth, and I, I've just talked about this. Um, there is value in our planning for these high responses, and I'll turn it over to Mr. Dixon. Dr. Henry has control of the clicker today, which is a good thing uh, for everyone. Um, so I want to talk about um, about our acute care capacity and uh, how uh, we are planning for various scenarios to deal with uh, the coming weeks and potentially months in British Columbia. I want to thank the people involved in this planning. It's an extraordinary group. Dr. Henry talked about the team, mostly at the BCCDC, which was involved in the modeling. We were also talking about uh, a provincial critical care working group that has come uh, forward to deal with, with what we need, our projections and what we need here in British Columbia of over 20 medical directors, executive leads and clinical specialists responsible for ICUs and high acuity, acuity units along with the epidemic modeling team from the BCCDC and, the, and an operational capacity modeling team that has assessed uh, our capacity as a province against four scenarios, South Korea, Hubei, Northern Italy cases, and Northern Italy hospitalizations. The reason we have done two for Northern Italy and made two preparations for Northern Italy is to uh, deal with the most severe version, which is focused on hospitalizations in Northern Italy, which has been the subject of some discussion in BC and elsewhere in the coming, uh, in the previous week. I wanted to also say that uh, this assessment, the full assessment, because this will be a short version of that assessment, is going to be uh, made available in a technical briefing. Uh, to the, it was available this morning to a technical briefing, and it's fully going to be on the BCCDC website. So all of the, the, the information that was available and made available this morning will be available to everyone in the public. The assessment really has, uh, has uh, two areas of focus. The first is uh, focus on our current capacity with respect to crit cl critical care spaces capacity and our current capacity with respect to ventilators for critically ill patients. That cohort of patients that will require critical care and the model assumes that that would be roughly 4.7% of patients. And the second is a focus on current hospital bed capacity for less acute patients requiring hospital care, which is also hospital capacity. That is a larger group of people between 13 and 14% of patients. And so if you go to the next uh, chart, you'll see uh, models uh, based on a South Korea type epidemic, a Hubei type uh, epidemic, a North Italy Northern Italy type epidemic, uh, uh, involving overall number of patients in a Northern Italy uh, type uh, epidemic based on a hospital based scenario. And you see the different lines as they go forward. The one in red at the bottom is South Korea. I note the star, if you look at it in, on this chart, that is British Columbia where we are today uh, based on the work of our epidemiologists. So if you look at those numbers, you'll see the trajectory in South Korea then the trajectory in Hubei province, which I remind everyone was a very, very serious uh, epidemic indeed, which is uh, still proceeding, but coming down the slope here. 
Uh, the, the one higher in mauve is uh, in the light mauve, I think it, you call that, or purple, is uh, northern Italy uh, based on, uh, based on, ca critical, um, on critical care patients. And then the final one is uh, uh, the uh, northern Italy, which is the hospital-based scenario. You'll note that the last two, of course, have not finished because they've not fully peaked. And so those are in terms of the planning and on the side. You're seeing uh, what that would mean for patients in British Columbia based on those various models. Uh, the next slide uh, addresses our ventilator capacity. So we told you we have 1,272 ventilators currently, or we did uh, last week when we reported out on the number of ventilators in BC. But we're using conservative models there. Some of those ventilators are used, for example, for transport, and we're certainly going to need those ventilators. But the focus here is on, uh, on our current inventory of critical vet care vents, particularly for adults. Our children's or our pediatric uh, uh, vents will be at BC Children's Hospital, but we are expecting a smaller number, of, a relatively small number, based on all, of, uh, all other jurisdictions of children requiring uh, ventilators. So uh, with that, you see that uh, we, uh, we have uh, in total uh, 457 adult critical, critical care vents. Uh, 109 of those are in uh, small, smaller hospitals or small hospital vents. And so that leaves us a total of 348 vents in the 17 hospitals that will be our COVID-19 centers, at least at the beginning. Uh, I note that we, uh, as we said yesterday, we added 15 ventilators yesterday that we have purchased. We've refurbished 38 ventilators that are ready to go and 19 other ventilators that will be ready to go next week that will be in addition to the 1272, in addition to the 348. So that's 72 more in those categories. And we also have ordered more ventilators, which we're expecting to come next week. So that gives you a sense of the ventilator capacity in British Columbia. Uh, our conclusions, and you've seen this in, uh, as we've dealt with the various scenarios, are that using the likely scenario of below or at a Hubei epidemic level using ICU and high acuity unit bed capacity along with vent capacity, we are, we are reasonably focused on being able to handle that within the 17 COVID-19 care sites. If we were to move to a northern Italy trajectory, BC would have to use all sites to meet bed demand and implement increased transportation of patients with between sites. And again, the more detailed discussion of that can be found in the, in the longer briefing. I'm going to move on to the second category of patients in, uh, in the patients in, um, who are in acute care but do not require critical care uh, based on uh, models uh, around uh, the four models we're using here. You'll find that uh, the expectation here assumes that 13.8% of all COVID-19 patients cases will be admitted to hospital. Uh, the admissions will commence five, five days, and the range is two to seven days after case identification. And you see the same uh, projections here, and you can see what happened in Italy in particular, where the system was at 100% capacity uh, at the time when um, the, uh, the surge of uh, COVID-19 patients uh, came. And so you see the, the extraordinary challenge, and you've seen visually uh, through reporting the enormous challenge that presented for the healthcare system in Italy. It's why we've been, uh, we canceled elective surgeries um, based on the advice, based on what we were seeing, based on what we were advised, based on projections like this. Um, uh, about uh, 11 days ago now, cancellation of elected surgery and other decanting or moving of, uh, of, for example, alternative level of care patients out of acute care hospitals to create space, not just space to address COVID-19, but, but space to ensure that we're ready for other things and other um, care that will be required in the healthcare system. Again, you see the three levels of chart. You see where BC is now. You see where South, which is uh, uh, closer to where South Korea was. Then you see the effects um, uh, in Hubei, in green, the, and the two Italian models there that we are preparing for. So we're going to summarize uh, um, uh, a bunch of the information that uh, we have. And just uh, to say, and you'll see this, um, uh, we'll see the full package, we'll see um, how we charted this against, uh, the, um, against uh, the various models. And you'll see 
as the number of patients would rise and as bed requirements rise. Uh, on the left, you'll see our potential capacity, which starts with ICU primary COVID sites. And then we add um, the high acuity sites, 50% of them, because the other 50% will certainly be required for other care and for other, um, um, uh, uh, other care in the healthcare system. So that adds to this 263. And then we add 85% uh, of the cardiac care unit sites, the cardiac surgery ICU sites, and the post anesthesia recovery rooms in the system to build up our capacity of beds. And then you see as you come down here for South Korea into the positive, that's how many beds we have more than needed in the various scenarios. And obviously there are some more significant challenges when you get a Northern Italy type situation. Again, in the second group, the acute care, the acute inpatient care demand, you again see a similar, uh, a similar chart which shows us adding beds as required to increase our capacity to deal with COVID-19. And you'll see the big challenges here. And this is why, if you look at this, the most serious model, the one of the Northern Italy type epidemic, the hospital-based one, uh, which we do not foresee, but which we have to prepare for, you see a shortage of beds here and only here. And uh, in that case, it's why we're preparing each of our health authorities. In each, in each health authority, significant new bed capacity and preparing for that. Not because we expect it to happen, but, but we have an obligation and we have a determination to be prepared for that to happen. So uh, a few conclusions. Uh, using the likely scenario of below or at a Hubei epidemic level, using inpatient medical and surgical beds, capacity looks good, uh, focused on using all sites. This has been enabled in large part by the decision made by health authorities and by the government to defer scheduled surgeries, which has opened up significant surge capacity across hospitals. If BC was to move to a Northern Italy hospitalized trajectory, BC would use all sites and bed capacity offsite from hospitals for less acute and surgical inpatient, uh, inpatients to open up additional capacity for COVID-19 patients in hospitals with ready access to critical care. You're going to see that start to happen. Those preparations start to happen starting next week with Vancouver Coastal Health, and we'll have more information on that. In other words, while we are absolutely determined to have the best results, we are preparing um, for the most, um, uh, the worst possible scenarios. We presented a range of scenarios based on evidence from other jurisdictions and a set of grounded, clinically oriented assumptions. As the days of the epidemic pass here in BC, Occur, uh, our, our, the, our needs will become more clear. I think it's fair to say, Dr. Henry, that our epidemiologists would always say that next week they'll be better and the week after they'll be better. And we are going to obviously continue to update this as we go forward. Our health authorities are planning for a cascading response and they're working to find a balance between the needs of potential COVID-19 patients and reducing the risk of unintended consequences on other non-COVID-19 patients needing access to acute and critical care. So as we create new and other options, our intention will be to continue to move other patients out of the hospital uh, if, if, in fact, our hospital begins to face challenges in dealing with uh, critical care and, uh, and overall patient care in the hospitals from COVID-19. So we're putting in place uh, uh, a plan, health authorities, each of them, each of them with their own emergency operations center, are putting in place a plan with their clinical and support staff they're putting in place a four to six week staffing schedule based on their planning. This will involve redeployment of key clinical staff to support critical care, redeployment of staff to support non-acute inpatient COVID-19 care, accessing additional staff to support both non-acute surgical and medical care, and that includes uh, re-registrants and training, trainee healthcare professionals doing the less, um, the less critical care work enhancing primary and community care capacity, support and monitor COVID-19 patients who are in self-isolation, and that will be important, and why the innovations in terms of virtual care are so important. Maintaining, and this is critically important, primary and community care needs to meet the health needs of all patients, all non-COVID-19 patients, which of course are continuing to occur, and providing support to clinical care professionals throughout the surge. I wanna thank uh, representatives of professional organizations and of unions. We met with them last night for their work and their support and their commitment. They are a critical part of our leadership team and we are taking steps with them to help address the human resource challenges. And finally, 
uh, health authorities are also focused on the third aspect, the first being beds and capacity, the second being human resources, the third being personal protective equipment, um, on implementing measures to best use personal protective equipment based on existing at hand and warehouse supplies. We're obviously focused every day, every minute of every day, in fact, on securing additional needed PPE in the coming weeks and throughout the months of April and May. And finally, you know, these are, of course, projections based on different scenarios. And Dr. Henry has spoken about this at length. But what's required to bend the curve, we sometimes saw, what's required to make the projections better is 100% commitment from people everywhere in British Columbia. 100% commitment, the idea that if you're sick, you have to stay home. 100% uh, commitment to the idea if you're required to self-isolate, to self-isolate. 100% commitment to not take un unnecessary trips. 100% commitment, 100% commitment to distancing between one another so that we can continue to bend the curve, that we can ensure that the resources that we've made available in our healthcare system and the passion and commitment and brilliance of our healthcare workers, our doctors and our nurses and our healthcare workers and our pharmacists and everyone else in the system can be used to address the challenge that we f challenges we face in the coming weeks. 100% all in. That's how we change the projection to the better. 100% all in. That's how we deal together with COVID-19 in the coming weeks, days and weeks and months. Thank you very much. And I'm gonna ask Dr. Henry to return um, uh, here as she has a couple of additional announcements uh, that are relevant today and an additional order to uh, describe and then we'll be open to taking your questions. Thank you. Um, this is, uh, you know, this is uh, a lot of work summarized in a very small uh, amount of time uh, with uh, a few graphs that uh, it don't begin to describe the amount of thinking that has gone into this. And I think the importance as well is engaging across the entire health sector on understanding what we can do and how we can do it together to protect the health system and to protect our communities in doing that. Um, today, though, I, there's one other order. Um, I'm issuing uh, the following order. All episodic uh, vending markets, what we know as farmers markets or community markets, must only allow vendors that ser um, serve food to be sold at these events. So vendors of all other merchandise at these events are prohibited. And this is recognition of how important it is for us to be able to access locally grown and produced food. And uh, the farmers markets are an important part of that. Um, but we don't want them to be areas where people are going and um, mingling in large groups uh, because the, of the risk right now that that entails. I will recognize, though, that the Ministry of Agriculture is working with the BC Association of Farmers Markets to make sure that we can um, have online um, models for farmers markets that will still allow us to get that fresh fruit and produce that we need here in British Columbia through this crisis. So... I think it's it's an understatement really to say, but our global community has changed in ways we could not have imagined even a few weeks ago. Um, the modeling, the thinking that we've been doing really reflects that. But we are in this together and we are making a difference in bending that curve and we need to get us through this together by all of us being committed to continuing to do this, to being kind, to staying connected even though we are physically distant. And finally, a message from the WHO uh, with Dr. Tedros. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. There are now more than half a million confirmed cases of COVID-19 and more than 20,000 deaths. These are tragic numbers, but let's also remember that around the world, more than 100,000 people have recovered. Yesterday, I had the honor of addressing an extraordinary meeting of leaders from the G20 countries. My message was threefold. We must fight, unite, and ignite. Fight to stop the virus with every resource at our disposal. Unite to confront the pandemic together 
We are one humanity with one common enemy. No country can fight alone. We can only fight together and ignite the industrial might and innovation of the G20 to produce and distribute the tools needed to save lives. We must also make a promise to future generations saying never again. Viral outbreaks are a fact of life. How much damage they do is something we can influence. I thank the G20 countries for their commitment to fight the pandemic, safeguard the global economy, address international trade disruptions, and enhance global cooperation. This is especially important for countries who are not part of the G20, but will be affected by decisions made by G20 countries. Earlier today, we held a briefing with around 50 ministers of health from around the world, which, at which China, Japan, the Republic of Korea, and Singapore share their experiences and the lessons they have learned. Several common themes emerged about what has worked. The need for early detection and isolation of confirmed cases, identification, follow-up and quarantine of contacts, the need to optimize care, and the need to communicate, uh, to build trust and engage communities in the fight. Countries also expressed several common challenges. The chronic global shortage of personal protective equipment is now one of the most urgent threats to our collective ability to save lives. WHO has shipped almost 2 million individual items of protective gear to 74 countries that need it most, and we're preparing to send a similar amount to a further 60 countries. But much more is needed. This problem can only be solved with international cooperation and international solidarity. When health workers are at risk, we're all at risk. Health workers in low and middle income countries deserve the same protection as those in the wealthiest countries. To support our call on all countries to conduct aggressive case finding and testing, we're also working urgently to massively increase the production and capacity for testing around the world. One of the most important areas of international cooperation is research and development. A vaccine is still at least 12 to 8, 18 months away. In the meantime, we recognize that there is an urgent need for therapeutics to treat patients and save lives. Today, we are delighted to announce that today Norway and Spain, the first patients will shortly be enrolled in the solidarity trial, which will compare the safety and effectiveness of, our, of four different drugs or drug combinations against COVID-19. This is a historic trial, which will dramatically cut the time needed to generate robust evidence about what drugs work. More than 45 countries are contributing to the trial, and more have expressed interest. The more countries who join the trial, the faster we will have the results. In the meantime, we call on all individuals and countries to refrain from using therapeutics that have not been demonstrated to be effective in the treatment of COVID-19. The history of medicine is strewn with examples of drugs that worked on paper or in a test tube, but didn't work in humans or were actually harmful. During the most recent Ebola 
epidemic. For example, some medicines that were thought to be effective were found not to be as effective as other medicines when they were compared during a clinical trial. We must follow the evidence. There are no shortcuts. We also need to ensure that using unproven drugs does not create a shortage of those medicines to treat diseases for which they have proven effective. As the pandemic evolves and more countries are affected, we're learning more and more lessons about what works and what doesn't. WHO is continuing to support all countries in the response. We have published more than 40 guidance documents on our website providing detailed evidence-based recommendations for governments, hospitals, health workers, members of the public, and more. More than one million health workers have been trained through our courses on openwho.org. We will continue to train more. We are also delighted to report that the COVID-19 Solidarity Fund has now received donations of more than 108 million US dollars in just two weeks from 203,000 individuals and organizations. Thank you to each and every one of you. The English version of our WhatsApp health alert now has more than 12 million users globally. And the Arabic, French, and Spanish versions were launched today. More languages will be added, including Bangala, Chinese, Hindi, Kurdish, Portuguese, Russian, Somali, Urdu, Swahili, and more. I have said before that crisis like this bring, bring out the best and worst in humanity. We have recently seen an increase in scams, cyber attacks, and impressions using WHO, my name, and COVID-19. I'm very grateful to those working in various national organizations providing critical cybersecurity intelligence to the WHO cybersecurity team. Thank you for your efforts to work with us to protect the health systems, health workers, and members of the general public who rely on our information systems and digital tools. Special thanks for, to Microsoft for assisting on this. I would like to end with something Singapore's Minister of Health, Gan Kim Yong, said during today's briefing. We're only at the beginning of this fight. We need to stay calm, stay united, and work together. I will repeat, we need to stay calm, stay united, and work together. I thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros. And as Dr. Tedros mentioned, we've got some exciting news on the, uh, about the Solidarity Clinical Trial from Norway. And we'll hear a lot more about it via a video intervention by Norway's Minister of Health and Care Services. Dear Dr. Tedros, dear colleagues, dear friends, dear all, I'm honored to address you in this afternoon's press conference. We are in the middle of a global health emergency, but we are also in the middle of a global quest for knowledge unlike anything we have ever seen. I find this happening in the midst of all the bad news from around the world. If we find treatments that are safe and effective, we can save lives. And we can protect healthcare professionals and other high-risk groups from developing disease. It is important that all countries pull together, share data and knowledge. The Solidarity Trial is an important piece in the global research effort. 
Together, researchers from all over the world will assess four of the most promising treatments for COVID-19. This solidarity trial starts including patients today. And I'm very happy to be able to announce that the first patient included is a patient at Oslo University Hospital. I would like to commend the WHO in taking on the global leadership in this difficult situation for all our countries and its initiative in setting up the Solidarity Trial. I would also like to thank John Anrettingen, Executive Director of the Norwegian Research Council, for taking the responsibility of chairing the Executive Committee of the Trial. Dr. Rettingen will bring expertise and experience from the Ebola vaccine trials in West Africa in 2015. This trial is in good hand under his leadership. I wish us all good luck with the Solidarity trial. Thank you. This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.